Hey guys, Weeby News here, and today I'm going to be talking about what appears to be the world's new favorite show, which is Squid Game. Over the past couple years, I've really gotten into Asian dramas, and I really owe my interest in these shows to Netflix and many of the dramas that they've added to their collection recently. I'm also a huge fan of survival game stories, which if you are subscribed to my channel, you probably already know, since I primarily talk about Danganronpa, a visual novel death game. But I've played and watched a lot of series with this trope, like Your Turn to Die, your Escape, Battle Royale, Alice in Borderland, Hunger Games, and several others. And because of my obsession with the genre, I'm really interested to know why this is one of the death games to really break out into the mainstream. Also, I do want to make sure and say that I'm not trying to say that Squid Game is better than any of the ones that I just mentioned. I like all of them for different reasons, but I do think this one is the most successful at appealing to both a mass audience and critics alike, and I want to analyze why that is. Squid Game has become Netflix's most popular series ever, with it being watched by 111 million users within its first 28 days, knocking Bridgerton off the top spot. This is a massive accomplishment, but what is it that makes it so special? There's plenty of survival game themed anime, manga, video games, movies, TV shows, etc. So why was this the one that really struck mainstream appeal with the entire world? Well, in this video, I'd like to take a look at its direction, story, and characters, and give my opinion on why I think it's the death game to blow up so much. Also, this video will contain spoilers for the entire show, so don't watch it if you haven't seen it. And you should probably watch it soon if you haven't already because there are spoilers everywhere. Also, please be sure to leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you do enjoy this video. And if you like the idea of me branching out into different topics, usually when I cover stuff that's not Danganronpa, the videos don't do nearly as well, so I really encourage you to uh, leave a like and a comment if you are interested in me talking about this or other things that aren't Danganronpa because it really, really does help me out. But yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and get right to the video. As many of you are already probably aware, Squid Game follows ki -hoon, a deadbeat middle-aged man who's severely down on his luck and completely broke, so much so that he can't even afford to buy a gift for his daughter's birthday, let alone even dream of getting custody. On top of this, he's also in debt to dangerous men who are willing to take his organs as compensation if he doesn't pay on time. Being as desperate as he is, he agrees to join a game where he can compete against 455 other contestants through playing six different children's games over the span of six days. All the participants were uniquely scouted due to their desperate circumstances, with them all being at their wit's end and completely in debt. And since they have nothing to their names besides the skin on their back, they are competing in these childish games with their lives as the wager. The plot seems pretty run of the mill at first when it comes to the death game genre, but one important detail in this game that is different from most is the fact that all the participants decide to join through their own will, and they're also given the option to end it early if the majority no longer wish to participate. Although I had seen people willingly enter death games before, I had never seen one actually conclude briefly due to democratic vote, and this was something that really stood out to me a lot. I think it's also really interesting how we see Il Nam, one of the original creators of the Squid Game, being the deciding factor in this vote too. Obviously, he'd want to continue the game since he gets to live out his dream as a participant in his passion project, but instead we see that he chooses to discontinue it and allow everybody to leave and reconsider their participation later. All the survival games I've ever seen have posed questions regarding morality, since these stories put characters into situations where they are forced to act selfishly in order to survive. A lot of times these stories tend to make many of us sympathize with characters who might be willing to do terrible things in order to survive or protect the ones they care about most. A lot of the time it makes me wonder how I'd act if pushed to the limit and it really makes me examine the more gray areas of morality. But all the ones I've seen have at least to some extent forced participation onto the players, whether it be they were just completely kidnapped and forced into the entire thing, or they entered willingly at first, but after they realized the danger of the situation and wanted to leave, they were no longer allowed to. Because of this, those death games are all limited to having themes strictly focused on morality and survival, whereas Squid Game instead uses the game to focus more on real world inequality and hardships. This is the first death game I've ever seen portray the real world as a worse and more unfair place in the game itself. A lot of the times, the primary goal of a group in this genre is to attempt to escape together without killing anybody, but this show is different. They quite literally have the option to escape together but they're in such desperate situations and so blinded by their greed that they end up risking their lives despite knowing how likely it is that they'll die. While voting on whether or not to continue the game, one of the players states, I don't see any chance out there, but in here I do. This relates to the primary ideology held by the game runners, that everyone in the game is equal and has a chance of winning. And this seems to be the main rule that the front man and the enforcers care about. It's interesting how they hold this rule in such high regard, considering that so many things that you would assume would be taboo are not. For example, the participants are permitted 
decided to kill each other in their living quarters. And the front man even said that he doesn't care if the enforcers sell or even eat organs from the dead players. The enforcers emphasize this ideology quite a bit during the run of the show, specifically the subplot with number 111, who is a doctor that received information regarding the next game from corrupt enforcers as long as he helped them traffic organs from dead participants. Once the front man became aware of this breach in the rules that affected the player's equality, he killed all involved and hung them up in the maze area as a warning to the remaining players. This subplot is so monumental to the themes of the game as well as the show as a whole, specifically when the front man states that these people have faced discrimination and inequality in the outside world and that this game is their last chance to fight fair and win. The second episode, Hell, really shows this discrimination and inequality referenced here. I think this episode plays a huge role in why the show's message resonates with such a large audience. The title is of course describing the real world outside of the game, and it's a pretty accurate description seeing the circumstances that the players face. For example, we see Ali, an immigrant from Pakistan that moved to Korea to make money for his family. He hasn't been paid by his employer for six months, and he even lost two of his fingers on the job and didn't even have enough money to go to the hospital for it. He's trying to support his wife and infant son and is becoming increasingly desperate for money. When his boss continually refuses to pay him, their argument eventually leads into a physical fight where the boss is caused irreversible damage and Ali eventually ends up stealing the money from him. All the characters are in terribly desperate situations where it's do or die, and some of them are not there from any fault of their own, but rather due to the systematic inequality that's been set in place. Ali, for example, is a hardworking and trusting man who's played by the rules and worked under his boss for six months without pay. But even though his boss had a huge stack of money plainly on his desk, he still refused to compensate Ali for his work. This is likely because of how easy it is to exploit migrant workers in Korea. According to an article by NBC, foreign immigrants were first allowed into South Korea in 1993 when the country's rapid development made it impossible to fill the blue-collar jobs in manufacturing, construction, and agriculture. Industrial trainees began coming to the country from other places in Asia seeking better opportunities. Employers would pay them very low wages and sometimes even seize their passports and pay them nothing at all, since their visas were tied directly to their companies and there were no foreign language options for reporting exploitation, they often had no options. Isolation, small living quarters, and dangerous work environments were constant realities. Many would move to other companies in hopes of better conditions, only to find that they had become undocumented because their visas no longer applied to their new employer. His situation really backs up the lines stated by the front man about how badly the participants were discriminated against in the outside world. All the odds are stacked against them, those that they try to rely on take advantage of them, like Ali's boss or the broker who stole money from Sebyak that she raised in order to get her parents out of North Korea. They were taken advantage of and abused because of their lack of resources, status, and desperate situation, and in no way do any of these scenarios show a fair world. But in the Squid Game, the enforcers portray to the participants that as long as they're able to pass all six games, the money can be theirs, and that they'll do everything that they can to assure that the players all start with equal footing, and that there's no advantages for anyone based off of their previous status or wealth. Even the titles of the episodes emphasize this idea that the Squid Game is a better choice, describing the outside world as hell in the title of the second episode, and describing the game as a fair world in the title of the fifth episode. Like that one player said, I don't see no chance out there, but in here I do. But is the game really as fair as they portray? Unfortunately, not really. Although what's presented to the players is their last chance to fight fair and square, the reality is it's actually just entertainment for the rich. The fairness imposed in the game isn't really for the players, it's for the VIPs who are betting. This is further shown in the glass tile race. The glass maker finally has something his work can help with, but the VIPs are dissatisfied, so the floor master makes changes on the fly to ruin his chances. This is similar to how the outside world works. Works. The poor try and fit within the boundaries and the rules that the rich set up through lobbying and their connections, and even if they succeed, the rich can just as easily switch it up on them with little to no consequence. We also later find out that Il Nam actually survived the Marbles game, as he's the original game host for the Korean Squid Game. This made me wonder if his life was ever really at risk at all, and I've seen others argue that it appears as if he was always protected during the games. In Red Light Green Light, his character, as well as the others near him, don't appear to have the same green overlay the others do in the doll's vision, implying that she was programmed to never see him or those near him as a target. Likewise, in Tug of War, it appears he doesn't have the same shackles or locks on his wristbands that the others do, so that he could have escaped from them if needed. The games as well have all been decided based on his childhood and what he was good at to give him maximum enjoyment too. 
making it easier for him to succeed at them. We also see that Ilnam's speech is what ends the murder spree at night in episode four. It almost seemed as if he was giving a signal to the front man to end it, and he's the one who decided the democratic vote in deciding if the game would continue or stop. So similarly to the outside world, the game is presented as a fair fight, but in reality, it's still biased to favor the rich. Even if the participants rise high enough and win the whole thing, it doesn't matter in the eyes of the rich. And this can be seen through the callousness of how they treat Gihun after he gets dropped off on a busy road while raining. The card containing the prize money could have easily been stolen by someone else, and his efforts would have all been for naught if that was the case. Furthermore, there's even a parallel between the VIPs betting on the players and Gihun betting on the horses in the first episode. The VIPs don't see them as humans, but instead as numbers, using that as their primary reason for betting on certain characters. I think it's interesting that both in the real world and in the game, it's portrayed that there's an equal chance for everyone to succeed, despite the fact that the rules and strings are being controlled by the rich behind the scenes in both. And it's even confirmed in an interview by some of the creators that their beds were stacked in their quarters to look like stairs, so that they could symbolize the constant competition to climb the ladder of success in modern society. So I don't think it's too far of a stretch to assume that the game as a whole is also meant to parallel the unfair competition seen in the outside world. One interesting detail in episode two is how it foreshadows each character's death in the Squid Game. Ali stole money from his boss, and the scene that decided his fate in the game was when Song Wu stole the marbles from him. Doc Su jumped off a bridge to avoid the guys from the casino he owed money to, and in the game he dies falling off the glass bridge. Se Byok threatened to cut her broker's throat after he told her she'd need another 4 million won to even bring her parents in North Korea over to China. In her death, she was cut in the throat by Song Wu. In episode two, we see Song Wu drenched in the bathtub, and it's implied that he's contemplating suicide. And in his final scene, he's covered in rain and sacrifices himself so that Gi Hoon can win. I feel like this foreshadowing is likely included again to show the similarities between the outside world and the game. Both present themselves as fair places where anybody can succeed, and in both the characters end up in similarly horrible situations. And it's ironic that they join the game to escape these fates of theirs, but in the end, they're just unknowingly post postponing them. And Gi Hoon, the one who actually wins and is supposed to reverse his fate, ends up not being able to use his money for the person who needed it most, his mom. To me, this is the show saying that in the end, money doesn't always bring you happiness. Il Nam tells Gi Hoon that the one thing the super rich and super poor have in common is that they're both miserable. And I think it's interesting that Gi Hoon experiences misery in both states. And now that I've done a breakdown of what I think is one of the most standout aspects of the show, I'd like to discuss why I think it has such an impact on us as the viewers. The writer and director of the show, Huang Donghyo, actually came up with this idea back in 2008. In an interview, he stated that it was continually rejected because others found it to be too morbid and unrealistic. But 10 years later, the world has become a world where such a ridiculous survival story fits well. He continues saying that others now have called it fun and realistic, and that sadly the world has changed and that's why it came out now. I think one of the reasons why it's more relatable now is because income and wealth inequality are reported to have risen in practically all major advanced economies over the past two to three decades. And a huge reason for this is due to the pandemic. The creator even references the Sang Yong Motors huge layoff. He admitted to referencing it by having Gi Hoon's traumatic past heavily resemble the events that took place in reality there. He mentions that he based Gi Hoon's downfall on the situation because it's something that everyone who lives in a capitalist society can relate to. Anyone can end up in the same situation as him. And the pandemic especially caused unemployment to rise dramatically during 2020. At this point, a lot of us have lived through a situation similar to his or at least someone we know has gone through it. So I believe this story really resonates with a lot of us because we can all see ourselves in the same situation as the characters, knowing that it can happen to anyone and has happened to many. So I think this really makes us sympathize with the characters since we can understand their desperation. Of course, this is just from an American's perspective. I've seen others state that stories with these themes like Squid Game and Parasite are due to classism in Korea. I saw a user on Reddit who goes by Bun 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 3 stated this, which seemed really interesting. The reason why Korea is an apt country for these themes to resonate is that Korea is a very highly stratified country. High schoolers take national exams that define which college they go to, which defines which job they can get. The SATs simply do not compare. There is much less mobility in Korea in terms of prospective opportunity compared to the US. It's the reason why so many Koreans immigrate to the United States, to give their children the chance to achieve what they could not. Gi Hoon keeps emphasizing 
sing how song Wu went to Seoul Business School, the equivalent of Harvard Business School, because things like education matter so much. And in this way, the plight of the players is that much bleaker. With limitations and their choices and their opportunities, no wonder so many of them return. I just thought that this was something interesting to point out, especially since I think it gives more context as to how these themes could more directly tie into the country it came from. Now, I talked about how the rules and circumstances of the death game make it unique, and I do think that's a huge reason as to why it's blown up so much. But another thing that I think makes Squid Game stand out from other survival games I've seen is the absolute simplicity of the games they play. The competitions quite literally consist of kids' games, and I think they made them this way for a few different reasons. The creator stated that he wanted to make them as simple as possible so that the viewers can shift their attention to the players and their emotions rather than the complexity of the game. In a lot of survival games, Alice in Borderland, for example, another death game that I really enjoyed, one of the main appeals of that show is learning what the new game will be, how insanely difficult it's going to be, and how the hero will be able to barely solve it. But in Squid Game, the games and the rules are very simple. Arguably the best episode focused on the Marbles game, which literally only had a couple of rules. This was to gain your partner marbles in a way that wasn't through violence. The reason why this was my favorite episode is because of all the relationships between the pairs and how emotional it was. Seeing Sebyuk and Ji Young share their tragic backstories together and become friends just to get torn apart moments later completely ripped my heart out. Watching Song Woo betray Ali and take advantage of his trust had me like yelling at the TV in anger. And seeing Gi Hoon trick Il Nam made me feel so sad and frustrated. I was so angry at him for taking advantage of Il Nam's illness, but I could also sympathize with him and wondered if I do the same, rationalizing it by thinking that since I'm younger and healthier, it's okay. When referencing this idea, Wang Don Hyo stated, other game products are solved by using the hero. There are no winners, no heroes, no geniuses here. It's just a story of losers. This idea of them all being losers really stood out to me. The reason they're there is because they're losers in the game of capitalism. Even if they do well, the rich are still allowed to throw them curveballs whenever it suits their tastes. And even if they win the whole thing like Gi Hoon, they're still looked down upon and treated inhumanely. Gi Hoon felt no sense of pride overcoming the games, but instead attributed his success to the sacrifices made by the other players. Guilt aside, they're all very simple games where luck plays a huge role in one's success, so there's not even a sense of accomplishment in winning. Everyone who participated was a loser, even him. The show decided to use these simple games to highlight the character situations, insecurities, and personalities, all things that are heavily relatable to many of the viewers. Any of us can end up desperate enough to play the squid game, and any of us could easily lose in the game itself. The show uses its strength, which is the characters, to steer the excitement of the games themselves, and I think this was a really good choice and paid off immensely, especially in the Marbles episode. I believe that Squid Game became so popular because wealth inequality in the world has risen dramatically, and that, along with many other factors, have led a lot of people to become more critical of capitalism, and Squid Game highlights the disadvantages of the system by showing them both in the real world and in the game. The simplicity of the games helps the viewer focus on the complexity of the characters, which helps us sympathize with them and focus on the struggles they face in society. Overall, it does a solid job of using all aspects of the show to highlight a very relatable message. But anyways, this will conclude the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please leave a like and a comment and subscribe and share it. I really would appreciate it. Like I said, a lot of the videos that I do that are not about Danganronpa don't do as good. So I would really appreciate the support. Also, I'd love to hear what you guys think about Squid Game. Why do you think it's so popular? Do you agree or disagree with my analysis of it? And I'd love to hear what your favorite aspects of the show were too, and who your favorite characters were. But yeah, again, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you guys real soon.